Celebrations across the country paid tribute to the sacrifices of the men and women of the armed forces yesterday. But for those who have served, Memorial Day was much more than just a parade, a rally, or a day at the beach. President Trump addressed some of them last night aboard a Navy ship docked in Japan. On this Memorial Day evening in the United States, Americans are concluding a sacred day of remembrance, reflection, and prayer. For the U.S. Army, part of that reflection took place on Twitter, where the military branch's official account asked, how serving has impacted you? And along with the tweet, the Army posted this from Private First Class, Nathan Spencer. serve something greater than myself. The Army's afforded me the opportunity to do just that, to uh, give to others, to protect the ones I love, and to better myself as a man and a warrior. Private Spencer's account is an overwhelmingly positive one, but for many of the more than 11,000 others who weighed in on Twitter, the impacts have been very different. Navy vet Jeffrey Scott tweeted, I can't even work a full 30 days due to anxiety and depression. I'm in constant pain every day, and I think about killing myself daily. Chantel Downs replied, PTSD, depression, anxiety, nightmares, all from sexual harassment during my service that nobody was ever held accountable for. And Sean P. replied with what he called the combat cocktail. PTSD, severe depression, anxiety, isolation, suicide attempts, never-ending rage. It cost me my relationship with my eldest son and my grandson. It cost some of my men so much more. After the outpouring of responses on Twitter, the Army thanked everyone who shared their stories. But those personal accounts are just the tip of the iceberg for veterans who are particularly likely to be homeless and suffer from mental health problems and are one and a half times more likely to commit suicide than the average member of the population, adding up to on average more than 20 deaths a day. Problems that's clear will take more than a day's remembrance, reflection, and prayer to solve. Joining me now are retired Army Brigadier General Jack Hammond, who's also the executive director of Home Base, a local veterans care organization. Dave Falvey is a major in the Massachusetts Army National Guard. He served in Iraq and Qatar and is now the commander of the South Boston Allied War Veterans Council, which runs the South Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade. And current Army Reserve Captain and State Representative John Santiago is also an emergency room doctor at Boston. Boston Medical Center representative. It's good to see you too. Yeah. Are any of you surprised by the response to the tweets that I read and the others? Any of that surprise any of you? You know, David and I were talking in the hallway. I, I, a lot of folks have very positive experiences in the Army and the military in general. Um, when you see something like that go up, you know, per, from a personal perspective, it, those are all legitimate feelings. You don't want to go and say, oh, like Pollyanna, my experience was awesome when everybody else was talking about some very real and legitimate issues. Do you think the Army was surprised by the response that got? Well, I'm sure they were. Yeah. I think they were, you know, they, were, they were trying to get folks involved and just energize and talk about your Army experience. Um, but as you said, they, they came back and said thank you for all your things because I, everybody recognizes those, those are valid comments. Yeah. You know, uh, we all have mastered the thank you for your service mantra that we sort of blithely cast off for people like you. But how are we doing as a society, would you say, in addressing the needs of veterans who come home? I certainly think, uh, you know, our country's trying, and there's some, some great examples. Um, you know, I think uh, Run to Home Base is, is our home base um, program is a good example of a, just a great organization that's, that's trying to do uh, right by those who've served their country. But, you know, there are a lot of veterans uh, in need, and it's not easy to take care of them all. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a constant challenge to try to, to try to do that right. You're nodding in agreement. Oh, if I could just add, I think, you know, it's, trem- it's a tremendous issue, um, but I think there's also a lot of opportunity to do some good work. I look at the House budget that we just finished uh, about a month ago. And at the State House. At the State House, that's yeah. correct. Um, we had a, almost a 25% increase with respect to ver- veteran service outreach, and we were able to increase the um, suicide prevention line by about 78%. So I think um, there's a lot of goodwill, a lot of work to be done, but I think we're moving in that direction. But yeah, it, it seems to me, as a person who hasn't served me, that as I said before, we're great with all the rhetoric mm-hmm. and thanking all of you and congratulating you and and... But it seems to me that we're really good at talk and not particularly good at action. I mean, all three of you said positive things. What would you say is the greatest unmet need, or at least not fully met need, that men and women coming home are, are experiencing, General? So I think the top challenge is th- there's a big transition when you leave the military, especially with combat experience. So number one, it's half of 1% of the population. So when you leave, 
How do you talk about what you saw in Iraq or Afghanistan to someone that doesn't have a frame of reference for that discussion? So that, that they feel a bit isolated. You, you go from being part of a very high-performing team doing amazing things. Um, you, you could be doing anything from building orphanages um, for kids in Afghanistan to taking out the Taliban. And then you come home, you, your six years is up, you can't find a job, you're couch surfing with your parents, and you feel like a loser. And then you start drinking a little bit more, you can get caught up with some depression, some anxiety about getting out there. All your friends have a six-year head start in the private sector. If you go back to college, you're 23, 24 with 17-year-olds. So you're really out of, out of sort, and that transition piece is hard because... We don't understand. You don't understand it, and it's hard for them to even process it. You know, Seth Moulton, Congressman, was sitting there not too long ago, right around, I think it was a Veterans Day, I don't think it was a Memorial Day, talking about how in Marblehead, where he uh, uh, was the, uh, represents, there were a couple of joint forums to address exactly what you're talking about, where men and women who came home talk to civilians in these open forums so that people like me got a greater sense of what life was like for people like you. Is that kind of thing, that, that sharing, help, or is it just a feel-good kind of thing? It's very important. In Massachusetts, um, you know, there, you go down south or out west, I mean, there's a lot of people. There's military bases everywhere. Um, maybe not quite as many people serve in, in this area, maybe as other places. So, uh, you know, that's something that I think those conversations are really, really great to have. Um, you know, one thing that has meant a lot to me uh, and is one of the most, uh, you know, uh, one of the best things that I'm, I'm a part of is a, a Veterans of Foreign War post in South Boston. And I joined, and I, I, when I joined several years ago, there were World War II vets, um, you know, Vietnam era, Korean War. And, uh, you know, we really felt no matter what era we were in, that was, uh, that was really something we felt a part of. And, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of good in the community. And I, I wish more people would kind of get involved like that. Where do you feel yeah. the greatest need is, where the greatest hole is in terms well, of? Well, I, I want to highlight what the general yeah. said. I think he said, you know, one to one and a half percent, um, you know, over the last several decades, the number of people, you know, in ro playing a role in public service, whether it's the Army, whether it's the Peace Corps, whatever, it's, it's been declining. And I think it's an important part of our culture we need to kind of highlight. And I really want to thank Seth Moulton for going out there and say, you know, public service has a role and we should get more involved. And for me, it's what I see every, every day in, and day out in the emergency room. I mean, I take, a people, take care of people with mental health issues all the time, substance use disorders, many of them of which have served in the military. And I think that's one that we really need to lead on. And I think addressing the substance use issue at large, which we've done at the state level, which more to be done, is a, is a first start. You know, I know that at the end of the Obama administration, a couple of things were done. I at least began the program where mental health treatment could be gotten on the same day, at least theoretically. There's what I think it's called the Choice Program, where you can go outside the VA and get uh, uh, reimbursed uh, with taxpayer money. What else? What else could we? Uh, be? You know, I have to say, you feel again as a person who didn't serve. You turn on the television years ago and you see a football game and you see this great patriotic display and celebration of military people. And then you listen to John McCain saying how the military had to pay for it and the teams accepted payment. Paid patriotism is what he, he talked about. How do we begin to make, uh, I guess, a transition where the vast majority of us who didn't serve understand better, as you described, and care more about those who did? I think one of the challenges we have, and it starts right in the enlistment process in this divide between military and civilian, only three out of ten military age people, men and women, meet the minimum requirement to enlist as a private in the Army. So 70 percent don't even meet the minimum requirement to go in even if they wanted to. So from that, that same pool is recruited by the police, the fire, uh -huh. you know, any, any agency like that. And so you're starting off on a difficult path. But then all of a sudden they go off to this experience, they come back home, reconnecting them back to society. There's a great book by Sebastian Younger called oh, Tribes. He was here talking about it too. It, it, but it, it, that's, that, that's really appropriate because that that's, represents the gap. But you, know, you all three, I have to say, are either candidly, I hope, being more optimistic than I, or maybe wanting to cast that. I don't think the vast majority of us really care. I, 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 when I see things like this paid patriotism or, or you know, this once a year celebration, uh, I don't get the sense that there's an active lobbying force, even though it's great that the additional money was put in the state uh, budget, for people who have done what you all have done, no? I think there was, I mean, there was one tweet that really spoke out to me, and it was a tweet about, you know, many people think that the Twitter 
the tweet backfired. Um, but for me, it was another reminder of all the sacrifices that people have to go through day in, day out. And, you know, it's not just, you know, last, yeah, just yesterday I was at a Memorial Day event in the South End and hearing from veterans speak about their experiences. Um, but reading all those tweets and li listening and, and learning what people have to go through day in, day out, just another reminder of the sacrifices that people go through day in, day out when they get back. You know, Charlie Rangel, a former congressman from Harlem, every year would file a bill to reinstitute the draft. And it's not because he wanted to reinstitute the draft. It's because he wanted to everybody to understand what life was like for your family and your family and your family so that we could connect. What is the thing that has to happen or in your, any of your estimations to connect us more deeply to the lives of people who served and are suffering? I'll just say that, you know, when I'm off, uh, you know, in the community in my uniform, uh, it almost brings me to tears sometimes how people come up to me and uh, just thank me for my service. And a lot of times they'll share their own story about, you know, any, maybe their, mil their, their son or their father mm -hmm. that served. And uh, I really do feel as though, um, you know, there is this connection between I'm glad them. To hear that. Yeah, I really, you know, and, and it's sometimes, you know, if we're in uniform at, at lunch, you know, we have to kind of beat back people trying to, to pick up our, our checks because, uh, you know, we don't want them to do that. But um, really, I've, I've felt very strongly about the support we've received in the community. Um, and uh, they may not necessarily have a, a true deep understanding of maybe what we go through, but I really feel as though they appreciate deeply what we do. General, you can put the exclamation yeah. mark on this. Yeah, so I, I think it's a mixed thing. So uh, part of it is the, 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 there's not a connection to the military. They, they've never served. Um, and they do feel bad because they want to be supportive. But the reality is the suicide rates are climbing still, despite our best efforts. So in the active duty population, conventional forces, it went up 20% last year over the year before. In the special operations, it went up 300%. Oh it's astounding. Uh, our military family members that lose their service members, they're another group that go unforgotten. And, and so I think the parades are nice, the recognitions are nice, but it's like the day after the wedding, you know, you're there on your own, and when you bring the baby home, it's, you know, now you're stuck. I think the challenge is the day-to-day -day stuff, the, the, you know, who's watching out for them long-term, and, and, and really having the political courage to figure out what are the veterans' needs moving forward and help the VA move into the 21st century, because they're, they're on a 1950s model, despite their best efforts, despite almost doubling their budget, they're still constrained by so many things to fix them. We're not addressing the full spectrum of needs because a lot of young men and women have these transition issues. That you saw it in their depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all PTSD. Um, getting after those and having mechanisms to assist them is huge. We have to go to the wedding every day, I think, General. Thank you so much for being here. Good to see you. Thank Thanks you. so much. General, appreciate your time. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, gentlemen.